Good evening and welcome to our first session of our Bible study on the prodigal son. Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks for bringing us to this place and this time so that we can ponder your word and hear from you your blessings, your message. Help us to concentrate, guide us by your spirit and enable us to receive those blessings in our innermost being. We pray, Lord, that you'll anoint George for this leading this study and that all that we say and all that we do will bring glory and honour to your name and that we will grow closer to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. So the reading uh, comes from Luke chapter 15 and beginning at first, verse 11. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and travelled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe and the best one and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house he heard music and dancing he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on he replied your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost 
and has been found. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I feel quite privileged actually to be to be asked by by, by Vicky to um, uh, take part in in this particular study of the the prodigal son during the um, the Lenten period and uh, having just completed a, a study on James, I hope you're not all shell shocked <laughs> and uh, wondering what's coming next. It's like the clergyman who is noted for being very, very long-winded and uh, he said from the pulpit, he said, for my tenth point, where shall we put Moses? And a weary voice at the back says, he can have my seat because I'm going home. <laughs> so I don't want anything like that to happen um, uh, tonight. So uh, as we look at, at the study, I will try to keep it as um, brief as we possibly can. It's a wonderful, wonderful parable and it has a wonderful message. It's a sort of what I call a timeless parable. The message that it has fits into every day and every age and it's got a very relevant message uh, for the Church of Christ um, uh, today. Those of you who were at the Ash Wednesday uh, service will remember that we, we d I did an introductory talk taking in the three parables in Luke chapter uh, 15. And we did this because we wanted to emphasize uh, that these parables were given by our Lord in response to the attitude of the scribes and the Pharisees. And you remember how they were critical and judgmental and condemning and uh, all the all three uh, parable stories emphasize the difference between love and a strict adherence to the law which so often was loveless and judgmental so the parable now of the prodigal son or it could be called the parable of the loving father and still be relevant uh, this that we're going to study now can only be understood if we immerse ourselves in the practices and the traditions and the cultures of the day in which it was given. And if we don't do this, then we begin to miss the whole point of what the story is all about. So it's a beautiful parable. And someone has said that it is the most divinely tender and most humanly touching story ever told. And someone else has said it's a most beautiful and complete picture of a loving and a caring God. And in these days in which we live, as we think about the tragedy of Ukraine and we look at the world in general, I think the church itself needs to begin to understand and rediscover the true nature of a loving and caring uh, God. And this um, parable um, certainly uh, does that for us. As we look at the customs and the practices of the day, and we try to understand the message that our Lord was giving. Now, you've all got notes, and the notes will give you the basis of the study this <coughs> evening, but there are blank uh, places in the notes, and there's places where... You can, you can um, if you want to, and you've got a pencil or a pen, um, you might want to sort of uh, put down one or two things. Because although the, the uh, study notes that you have are the ones that are recommended by the course, of course, I put my own spin <laughs> on, on the thing as well. And so um, I'm going to um, look at the study this evening. <laughs> And wait for it because you should have brought your pajamas, I think, because we've got um, five headings and uh, I'm going to try and go through them as quickly as I possibly can. And I hope that you'll find it meaningful um, this evening. The first, all the headings begin with the letter R. So that's easy to remember because the first head heading is his request in verse 12. 12 Father, 
give me the share of the property that will belong to me. And if we try to interpret this in the, the day and age in which we live, we might say, and people might say, well, um, perhaps that's not an unreasonable request to make. But when we seek to understand it in the light of the traditions and customs of the day, we begin to see a different light on the whole thing. Because here we have a, a young man and he wants his inheritance irrespective of the effect it will have on others. And the whole thing sets before us a spirit of selfishness and insensitivity. He was choosing a path that was totally contrary to the Father's will for him. And the Father, in his response to the requ that request, he encompasses the Son's desire for a different way of life by love and letting him go his own way. But we understand this in the light of the customs of the day because this was a break with the tradition carefully upheld by the larger community of which he was a part. The hearers of this parable would have been amazed at such a request. The eldest son received a double portion when the father died and the other children inherited the rest. And in this case, the, old, the eldest son would receive two thirds of the property and the younger one, one third. But the division of the property only occurred in our Lord's day when the father died. And here the younger son asks, for his inheritance now. To make such a request when the father was still alive actually was akin in our Lord's day to wishing him dead. He wanted his father's things, but not his father. He wanted the blessings, but not the responsibilities. And, and so we can see the Im impact of this as we look at it within the customs and traditions of the day and age in which our Lord lived and told this story. This was something quite out of the ordinary. And the Father's response, the Father's response is all the more wonderful when we understand that. But you know, in my life, as a clergyman and working with people, one of the things that I found again and again and again was parents who were very strict and domineering. And in one particular case, there was this daughter and if a young man showed an interest in her at all, the young man got short shift. And, uh, she was held with a tight rein, so to speak. And eventually, you know, she resented what mum and dad were doing for her. But she was a very unhappy uh, girl indeed. And um, you could see the impact of it all uh, upon, her, upon her life. And I was reminded of what the psychologists uh, teach us. That if you want to hold on to your children, you've got to learn to let them go. And the father here fits this. Because rather than bawling his son out, or whatever the case may be, he lets him go. Irrespective of that, what that will mean for the son in the future. He could have said, no, you're staying here. You're going to be under my thumb. Um, but no, you see, this is not how God deals with us. He gives us the freedom uh, to choose. And sometimes 
it gets us into all kinds of troubles and trials. And sometimes we end up saying, where is God in this? But, you know, it doesn't work like that, does it? Quite often, because God loves us, he gives us that freedom um, to go. And if we want to make a mess of things, uh, so be it. But certainly, that's how God works. And when we look at our world today, and we look at the dreadful things that are happening, and when people cry out and say, where is God in all of this? Well, it's not an easy one, I know. But nevertheless, you know, we've got to see that God made us as we are, with freedom of choice and free will. And uh, he gives us this choice, and sometimes it does lead to difficult times. So that was a little look at his request. Now, we move on and we look at his response. In verse 13, he travelled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. You see, in our Lord's day, it, the whole thing was uh, intensely patriarchal. And because of that, I mean, the father's response indeed is, is, set, is startling. Respect for elders and particularly for one's parents was of supreme importance. A traditional Middle Eastern father would have been expected to drive his son out rather than anything else. But not this father. He simply divides his property between them. And it's an interesting sort of thing because the Greek word that is translated uh, property uh, in this parable literally means life. A more a concrete word to denote capital would have been used, but it isn't. And it's interesting this because in that culture, the very identity of a person was tied up in his place, their land. To lose part of the land was to lose part of yourself. And what it really meant was that the younger son is asking the father to tear his life apart. And the father does so for love of his son. And then the son went to a far country uh, searching for satisfaction in a way of life that can never satisfy. He squanders everything uh, through an out-of-control lifestyle. And when I was looking at the study, I re was reminded of the words of Jeremiah when he said, um, uh, the message from God, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. And just as perhaps the first lesson of the study is that, you know, we've got to learn um, uh, to let people go. The second lesson is that the, the fleeting pleasures of this world and that sort of thing, they are fleeting. They're not lasting. And, and nothing in this world is um, lasting. And um, if we put all our eggs in that one basket, well then we're going to find ourselves in a lot of trouble. And yet a lot of people today uh, do just that. The material things of life are quite often the most important things. And the people seek for position. They seek for greater possessions. You only have to look at uh, the adverts to see what's been uh, thrown at people. And they, they look for all kinds of, of, of things in this world and yet at the end of the day as we so often say what have we you and I got now that we can take with us when we die and we know that there's nothing um, that we can take with us because all of the things of this life are fleeting and um, they may satisfy for a short time they may give pleasure for a short time but it is for a short time and it is fleeting and it is passing and there's nothing substantial uh, about the whole thing and the younger son was to find that out because when he ran into trouble all the friends who associated 
with him when he had uh, plenty of money, didn't want to know. And um, he was left in a pretty, pretty difficult um, situation. The third heading is his realization in verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have, have bread enough and to spare? But here am I, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And you know, just as the psychologists would tell us that if you want to hold on to your children, you've got to learn to let them go, so they would also tell us that when people need help, they only respond to help when they hit rock bottom. And that's exactly what happened to this young man. He hit a rock bottom and he began to ask himself some of the most important questions of life. Where did I come from? What am I doing here? Where do I go from here? And they're all questions that people today are asking themselves. So in response to his realization, he devises a plan. He will return to the father and um, he has forfeited the right to be a son and he will offer to become one of the hired men. Now, in a Jesus' day, there were two types of uh, people that were hired. There were servants who worked on the estate and they lived there. But then there were others, hired men, um, and they were men with various uh, trades, uh, various craftsmen who lived in local villages and earned a wage. And the younger son has disgraced his family and therefore the whole community and he's been dead to them. And so um, he says, right, I'm going back. But the rabbis of that day taught that an apology was not enough. There had to be restitution. So that's really why the young man says, make me as a hired man so that I can pay off part of the debt. When I worked in Liverpool um, in the 60s, actually, it seems an age ago now. Well, it is an age ago, isn't it? Um, I got to know a Jewish family. All intents and purchases, very, very nice people. But their daughter married a, uh, married a Gentile. And the family disowned her totally. And it was she was counted as dead. And that's the sort of thing that we're facing here in the story of the prodigal. But the third lesson that we learn surely from this is that however good our intentions may be, we can never pay the debt that we owe to our Heavenly Father. And um, Augustus, the top lady who wrote the, the, the hymn, Rock of Ages, he had it right when he said, Not the labours of my hands can fulfil thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. You must save and you alone. And if within the life of the Christian church we had a message that said to people if you really work your fingers to the bone and if you really do this, you do that, you do the other thing and at the end of the day you'll merit heaven there would be an awful lot of people who were only too willing to go down that path. It's a peculiar thing. But the message is of free grace. A loving God we can never never pay him back and um, no matter how good our intentions may be so the fourth heading is his return in verse 20 his father saw him and was filled with compassion as a rule, 
distinguished Middle Eastern patriarchs did not run, but this father does, and he shows his emotions openly. I'm not going to wait until you have paid your debt, or until you've groveled enough, or until you've earned your way back into the family. I am simply going to take you back. The Father's love and acceptance is completely free and it can never be merited. And of course this is the real picture of God's grace. And the definition of grace is the, the unmerited uh, favour of God. And this love of the Father that we all experience and that the word of God lays before us. God so loved the world that he gave us some. This love of the Father for you and I, we can never merit it. No matter what we do, we can never do that. And no matter how much we grovel, it doesn't really matter. This is a simple business. I am simply going to take you back. And I find that really, really I'm so grateful actually because God over my lifetime has been so patient with me. So lastly, the final heading is his reception in verse 22. Bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. The best robe is the father's robe, proof of his acceptance, and the ring was a sign of sonship. Servants did not wear rings or shoes or expensive garments. This lad was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and he's found. Away from the father he's lost. Back with the father he is alive. This is a wonderful clear illustration of God's love and forgiveness. In that society and time, most meals did not include meat. Meat was an expensive delicacy. Meat was often reserved for special occasions and parties. The celebration, the sun restored to life, family and community. This for us today is a picture of divine grace. The father emphasizing the fact that the son's acceptance rather than what he had done wrong. And for you and for I, that's what divine grace does. The father accepts us and he doesn't beat us over the head with what we've done wrong. And there's here divine generosity as well. Think about the clothes and the, the jewelry and the, the, the joyful and the costly uh, celebration. The picture here is of a God who is a generous God. The Bible says that he sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. That every blessing in Christ is ours so generous is our God but it's also a picture of divine goodness <coughs> and it was the memory of the father's goodness that brought the boy back I don't think the boy coming back would have come back if for any reason he had thought that the father was going to meet him with austerity and rejection so there are five lessons there that I think maybe give us food for thought as we think about this particular, the, the younger son uh, as he is depicted in this parable. That the, you know, it's um, lessons that we all need to learn and lessons that are very dear to our heart even in this uh, day and in this age in which we live and I hope that 
some of those thoughts coming out of this particular uh, study may be helpful to you in your understanding of God and of his working in our lives when we go astray and we come back uh, to him. The study next week will be a study on the elder son. But for now, I'll sit down. <laughs> Thank you so much.